Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Today, I'm going to be presenting Caldera, which is a new method we developed um, to do bacterial GWAS on, on deep run graph. Um, so the presentation is going to go uh, in five points. First, I'm going to explain um, why bacterial GWAS is an interesting problem and what it actually signifies. Then I'm going to give a quick overview of the literature and why there was a need for a new method. Then I'll present that new method, Caldera, um, and I'll show how it performs both on simulated data and uh, real data. So first, what does GWAS mean in the most broad term? It's uh, genome-wide association studies. It means finding some association between a phenotype of interest and genetic features. Um, and both those things can be defined quite broadly. Uh, for example, we can think about finding all the SNPs, so the single nucleotide polymorphisms, um, associated with height in humans. So in that case, height would be the phenotype of interest, and the SNP would be the genetic feature. And so what the data looks like um, in our more specific problem, we're just going to consider binary phenotype, so zero or one, um, and then a set of genetic sequences. So why do we care? Uh, I'm going to give two examples here. The first one is antibiotic resistance. Um, there's our antibiotics that we use to treat uh, bacterial infection are becoming less and less effective due to the selective pressure they put on those bacteria and overuse. And so better understanding the mechanism of antibiotic resistance could help us develop better drugs or new drugs in the future. Um, but there is not only bad bacteria, um, the microbiome itself, and here I've got an example of the human microbiome, both in the gut, in the skin, in the mouth, um, is becoming ever more interesting to researchers and to pharma. And so getting a better understanding of how it works, how it coordinates, what's in there um, is also crucial. So the next question is, why do we need to develop specific methods for bacterial GWAS? After all, there's been a lot of research, a lot of literature on human GWAS. You've probably heard about all those papers linking um, some phenotypes, height, especially risk for disease uh, with SNPs in humans. And that's the reason we need to have something specific for bacteria is because the genetic diversity in bacteria is very different from the genetic diversity in human. Most of the methods in human actually focus on SNPs. So they assume that most of the variation between individuals are going to be those specific nucleotides that have differences, that have mutations. However, in bacteria, the breadth of genetic diversity is much larger. And there are rearrangement, there are accessory gene, there are other mobile genetic elements that will be present or absent in the genome, as you can see on the figure on the right. And so you need something more flexible that can actually consider multiple scale of genetic diversity to do bacterial GWAS. And so what exists currently to do GWAS in bacteria? So I'm gonna use a simple example of antibiotic resistance. We have a sensitive bacteria on the left and the resistant bacteria on the right, and they both have very short genome of nine uh, a base pair and they differ just by one SNP. So C becomes A uh, from the sensitive to the resistant. So the first way to do it is to use KMERS. So KMERS, you just break down the sequence into all words of length K. So here, K equals four in this example that you can find in those sequences. And so you can find all the KMERS of your sensitive bacteria, and all the KMERS of your resistance bacteria, and you can just compare them. You can do a differential presence analysis of those cameras. So here, for example, you will see that TCGC is only present in the sensitive bacteria and TCGA is only present in the resistant bacteria. However, because those tend to be short words, it's really hard to then interpret and understand what does that mean if that camera is differentially present or absent between my um, phenotypes. So one way to solve this has been to use compacted De Bruyne graphs. So De Bruyne graphs are using all the cameras. You put an edge between two cameras if they are consecutive in a sequence that you have in your data. So that's the graph over here. And then what you do is you're going to compact the linear sequences in your graph into unitics. And so that means 
your, the size of your node is going to depend on the diversity on the genetic diversity in your samples. And you go from the table on the left to the table on the right. So you've lost no information. It's just that the features are longer and so are much easier to interpret. So you win on both sides. First, you have less tests to do so that decrease the problem of multiple testing. And also you increase interpretability, both because the features are longer and also because now you have context. So you can see if this is differentially present, you can also look at what's around it in the graph and get better interpretation. This advantage of having unities over cameras mean that actually method that was developed for cameras now are recommend using unities as input. For example, PyCR. Now in the documentation said they would recommend uh, users choose unities. And so this context idea is actually what led us to develop Caldera. So here we have an example um, it's part of a De Bruyne graph. Uh, and the dark red nodes have been called significance by dbgwas, which is one of those tools that do GWAS on unities of a De Bruyne graph. And so you see, you have multiple dark red nodes uh, where we have statistical significance of association between the presence or absence of those nodes and antibiotic resistance in this setting. However, you can also see that we have a lot of light red nodes. For those, we do have an imbalance. Those nodes are more present in antibiotic resistant samples than in antibiotic sensitive samples, but not enough that we have statistical significance. And we can see that actually this full graph, subgraph, kind of looks linear. What's happening is that it's actually one gene. Uh, and you have a lot of places where some mutation will cause antibiotic resistance, actually will be associated with antibiotic resistance. Um, but because we have multiple places we can have the mutation, if you do it at the node level, you will lose power and you will lose interpretability. What we would want to be able to do is to test this entire subgraph for association with the phenotype instead of just the nodes one by one. And that's why we developed Caldera. So in Caldera, we are going to consider all connected subgraphs. Because we have for each node, for each unity, we know if it's present or absent in um, any sample. To compute the pattern of presence of absence of a subgraph in a sample, we're just going to do an OR on the pattern of all the nodes. And then we look at the neighborhood of the subgraph, and if adding any of the neighbors does not change the pattern, that means that the statistical test we're going to do for the subgraph with or the subgraph without the neighbor is going to be the same. So from the data point of view, they are not distinguishable. Um, and so we're just going to consider the largest one we can get by adding the neighbors without changing the pattern. That's called a close connected subgraph as our features. However, if we want to enumerate all the close connected subgraphs in a De Bruyne graph from the bacteria, which has about a million to 10 million nodes, we come into two problems because the number of um, CCS is actually exponential with the number of nodes. First, we have a problem of multiple testing because we're going to be testing so many hypotheses. We have to correct for this multiple testing problem. And so the correction is going to be so big, none of the subgraphs are going to come out as significant. Secondly, we just have a problem of computational power. Um, there is just too many of them, and we cannot enumerate them all in a reasonable time. So to solve both those issues, we're going to use something called Tarant's trick. Um, which was introduced in the 1990s. And so I'm going to give you an example first. So let's say we have a recruiter called Greg, and Greg just throw away half of the resumes he sees without looking at them. That makes him a bad recruiter. Uh, now let's say we have a statistician called Susie, and Susie has 1,000 hypotheses to test, and she just throw away half of them without testing him. Is Susie a bad statistician? Well, actually, if you just consider the family rise error rate or the false discovery rate, what she does by throwing away half of the hypothesis is completely correct. However, of course, she, if she does it randomly, she will lose some power. But Tarun trick is kind of this idea that you can actually throw away hypothesis without testing them that won't impact your family rise error rate. And sometimes you can do it in a clever way 
so that you don't even lose power. You can actually even increase it. And that's the idea that with discrete distribution, so here we have a binary phenotype, zero or one, and our pattern that, pattern that also zero or one because we just look at presence or absence of subgraph. So if we have discrete distribution and discrete tests, then the p-values that are possible are finite. And especially they have the smallest possible value, which we're gonna call p star. And that value is strictly larger than zero. So if our rejection threshold is lower than p star, we know that no matter what the data will look like, this hypothesis will never be significant. So we can just throw it away. And then, so that first I was going to decrease our number of hypotheses, and that's going to change our threshold if we do family-wise error rate. And so we, should, we can actually play around with both the things and have fewer hypotheses to test. Um, and so we are more likely to actually have something significant. So that actually solved the first problem of multiple testing, but it does not solve naively the problem of computational power. In order to solve the computational problem, we need to enumerate the CCS in a clever way. To do that, we're going to take advantage of something called reverse search. Reverse search uses the, the idea that if you have a reduction, which is a function that takes an element of a set and return a strictly smaller element of that set. And you can actually invert that, that reduction. So inverse re reduction. You can start from the null set and enumerate all the elements of the set once and only once. Here we have an example. If we use um, all the sets of numbers between one, two, and three, the reduction is just remove the largest element. So if we have, for example, one and three, we remove the largest, which is three. We only have the set one, and then with one, we go to the empty set. So the reduction takes any element of the set and return a strictly smaller element. If we can inverse it, here, for example, from one, we add two to get one, two, or we add three to get one, three. So the inverse reduction returns multiple elements of the set, possibly, or none in the case of three. Then this is enough starting from the null set to enumerate all the element. We do that on all CCS by also ensuring a relationship on the minimal, the, the minimal p-value. If we have two CCS and one of them is the child of the other, so it's returned by the inverse reduction, then we also ensure that its smallest p-value is larger than the smallest p-value of its parent. What that means is that if we prune S, if we remove S because it's not testable, because its smallest p-value is higher than the threshold, then any of its descendants via inverse reduction and their descendants and their descendants and so on will also not be smaller than the threshold. And so we can actually prune that entire region of the tree. We don't have to explore it. And that's why we actually solve both the issue of multiple testing and the computational power problem with Terran trick by building such a structure. So what does that look like in practice? So first, we compared with a method called um, COIN. So COIN is an algorithm that actually enumerates um, close connected subgraphs, but doesn't use this tree structure. And so it does not allow for the same amount of pruning. And we actually, we actually improved on COIN because COIN was using an old algorithm that took advantage of Tyrone's trick. And we actually used the more recent one that's much more powerful called LAMP2. And so we looked at um, running time of coin plus lamp two, which we, we implemented versus Caldera based on the size of the graph. And you can see if we reach to 20,000 nodes, the um, competitor actually takes nearly a day to actually run on 20,000 nodes, whereas our method runs in about 200 seconds. That means we can actually scale to that effect of millions of nodes um, and actually apply those methods to bacterial GWAS, and it was not the case in the past with previous methods. That's actually um, very important because now we can actually apply that method to real data. Uh, and so one example here is a data set of 280 uh, pseudomonas bacteria that have resistant status to amikacin. So amikacin is an antibiotic. Uh, and in that data set, 
so there is no grand truth. We don't know all the genetic variants that are supposed to be associated with amicacin resistance, but there is two of them that have been validated. Um, there is the ASC6 gene that I've shown before, and then there is a plasmid. And we can see actually Caldera returned those two components as the first two components, so the most significantly associated with the phenotype. Um, and more interestingly, it returned the plasmid, which you can see on the right, that's the Debrun graph of the plasmid, has one entire component. And so it actually makes interpretation much easier to get the same thing with previous methods. So if you use, for example, DBGWAS, which was kind of the state of the art of using the Brun graph, but they were testing at the unitic level, you would need to allow familiarized error rate uh, of 0.2 to even return this plasmid in three components. Whereas here we have a familiarized error rate of 10 to the minus eight, uh, and we still return the plasmid as one component. So to conclude, we've shown how Caldera can improve an existing bacterial GWAS method by providing a scalable method, computationally scalable method, that can generate easily interpretable genetic element associated with a binary phenotype of interest. To do that, we've used both Tyrone's trick and the concept of reverse search. Caldera is not only limited to bacterial GWAS and to Debrun graph for exploration, We've shown in the paper one example where we use a regulatory network of gene as the graph. The main limitation of the paper and the method is that it does not currently scale to metagenomic data sets where the graph size is over 100 million nodes. It can even reach a billion nodes. Um, to be able to explore graphs of that size, we'll probably actually need to reduce the Debrun graph by compacting it further. Thank you for listening to this talk. Uh, if you have any question, uh, you can contact me on my email address as listed here. The code to actually use Caldera, you can find it on GitHub. Um, it's a Python program, uh, so you can install it. There is all the instruction on there. There's a small tutorial as well. We also made the paper fully reproducible. Uh, it's also on a GitHub repository, and there is a Docker file that will allow you to reproduce the entirety of the paper. Um, if you want to play around with that and, and look at the data. Uh, and thank you again for listening.